This is the BBC television service. And now another marvellous effort from the clock department leads us into one of the most popular programmes of the 1970s. As they used to say, let's go nationwide. Nationwide, absolutely brilliant. Honest to goodness, tabloid television. It had the confidence to ignore the news, ignore current affairs if they were boring. Nationwide made this, this country, Britain, an entity. The first publicity programme I ever worked on that printed its own note paper. Damn sight more than skateboarding ducks, you know. Nationwide ran for 14 years, from September 1969 to August 1983. In all, 3,131 editions of Tea Time Current Affairs. At its peak in the mid-70s, over 12 million people tuned in every evening for a unique mix of hard news stories, sentences totaling 4,000 years to 35 IRA men and women, investigative consumer journalism, the knockout will be on BBC One at a regional roundup tonight. If you want to watch it, I'm sure many of you do. Let me now very quickly go over to Bristol if I can. Brian Roberts, I gather you some news for us. Yes, and some good news just a in nationwide the speciality the light hearted item. Throw your mind back to the merry month of July and ask yourselves how on earth these young maidens could have been responsible for a serious attempt to deal with the problem affecting half the men and women in Britain. <laughs> you wouldn't expect is two of Britain's brightest brains deserting the academic panoply of gown and lecture theatre for the sanctity of a TV set. But what is this TV programme that's ensnared the colossal minds of Dr. Charlotte Brunsden and Dr. David Morley? Believe it or believe it not, it's only too familiar. It was a period when the real research on television current affairs was all on hard, hard news stories. And one of the reasons that Nationwide was interesting is precisely because it didn't seem very interesting. It's precisely because it seemed to be about nothing. Mrs. Glynn, when you bought this Puerto Rican package, did you seriously think that you were buying instant sea pets? It was, as I understand it, the most popular current affairs programme among, among all respondents in the BBC's own audience research. It was clearly a very important programme. And yet it seemed to be dealing with trivia. Michael, you're always saying while you're working. Fundamentally, there was a tremendous loyalty to the regional programme. People all over the country were switching on to look north, to points west, to scene around six, all those programs. And then they were going away. And so we decided to try to latch on to that regional loyalty and develop the nationwide style and theme as a consequence. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. When the poor have cried, Caesar have wept, Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal, I thrice presented him with a kingly crown. OK? Mm. Once Nationwide began to build a decent audience at tea time, and that put the spine on the whole of the BBC One audience right through the rest of the evening, it was virtually immovable. 
the BBC didn't know what it had given birth to. And I suspect if it had known, it probably wouldn't have done it. It was this popular appeal program that had a soul. Alex, can you talk to CK supervisor, please? On the bill, on air. Nationwide was very plain speaking, and I think that what it encouraged in its viewing audience was a trust. They knew that at the end of every day, they could turn it on, it would be there, it would be very familiar, very trustworthy. They would be told what was going on in the world in words of one syllable. One of the things Nationwide represents is um, an attempt by the BBC to make ordinary television. Um, popular television, but television which also involves people. So it's going to be news that isn't about other people, but in some curious way about the audience themselves. So that one was just sitting quietly in your living room. You'd just be sitting quietly in your living room, eating your tea, watching Nationwide, and then you suddenly find yourself asking questions to a member of state. You know, the Nationwide reporter would be saying, oh, we want to know what the viewer at home wants to know so let's go straight to vic feather who i know is going to be called in that film by somebody big brother but this is a sample here in front of me in this tray of the kind of interest aroused in the country in you and in bangor a port maddox school teacher mr jones he wants to know mr feather your arrogance and pomposity seem bent on bringing the government down should you not be helping this great country of ours in its economic plight instead of playing into the hands of communists. Could you ask me to answer this? I would ask you to do it. I see. In five years that I was editor, the extraordinary thing is that more than 10,000 ordinary people appeared in the program, giving their views on national issues, giving their views on local issues. I'd like to ask Pam Bedard in Manchester, if she can hear us, to put her question to Vic Feather. Uh, I'd like to ask why I should join the union. Yes, what occupation is yours? I'm a reporter. A reporter? Well, first of all, I think that if you didn't join a union, you mightn't be a reporter very long, but uh, that's uh, quite a part. It wasn't uh, the BBC I'm... speaking. It was the BBC providing an opportunity for the nation to speak to itself. And that was the really important thing. No one got in the way. It's often been said that Nationwide itself was a family, and so it really was. I hate to say it, but I've been called dad sometimes. I'm going to call Sue Lawley mum. But anyway, we really were a together team, a family. And out there were families we were talking to. Granny Watts, little Tommy Watts when he came home from school. Mum Watts while she was making the high tea or the dinner. And dad, if he got home in time, he watched too. We embraced those families and they in turn embraced us. Gnome file. Case History 68 and the home of Mrs. Harris. There are no secrets in her garden. Mrs. Harris is a proud gnome owner. They're on display for the outside world to see. Nationwide really did speak to something about the way in which people understand themselves. They understand themselves often. The real me is not me at work, it's me at home doing, doing what I want to do. Mrs. Margaret Miller gets tea ready, keeping an eye on two-year-old Vanessa. Graham, aged eight, and Tracy, nine, play quietly by themselves. While in the front room, textile worker Ron Miller and six-year-old Gary are absorbed in a favorite program. They watch on even though they know there's a snag. The wrong side's going to win again. <laughs> Indians biting the dust. That's why Saturday mornings at Bankfield Terrace are different. Like the Seminole Navajo Kickapoo, like those Indians, I'm an Indian too. It's like all these, these attempts to try and have good news programs. It's so unnewsworthy that the logic of it is that they're pushed towards the eccentric and the quirky. then no doubt that uh, there were extraordinary unusual larger-than-life characters throughout the UK 
and in the course of the history of Nationwide, a great many of them, if not all of them, appeared on the programme. I think Nationwide was really a pioneer in kind of Britain as a theme park, and a certain kind of heritage idea of what Britain was. Frank, it's Dave Early on Double Three Six Zero. There's Sark. Now, I know Sark's been done to death at Stoys, but it's such a lovely place over there. And the thing is, they're, uh, they're getting this new, new dame, <laughs> and he's a man. Anyone who did a pompous job but was rash enough to allow themselves to have a weasel put down their trousers. So, so Vickers... The minute you walked in the joint I could see you were a cow of distinction A real big spender The Reverend Andrew Dowell, a young curate from Manchester, is the owner of a most singular talent. People who prided uh, themselves in the number of uh, raw eggs they could swallow. And any sort of physical deformity. And brave troopers as well. Nation was a bible of cliché, you know, and, and basically in comedy what you're doing is, is, is taking cliché and, and, and pointing out that it is cliché. And um, I, I found it was a wonderful training ground for not 9 o'clock news, which was where I was afterwards. Mr. Weemley, can you hear me? Uh, <laughs> well, that's all we have planned for now, because now we can go to Bristol for news of an earlier story. I believe that there in Bristol you have news of a duck that does nothing. Uh, no, we've yes. got... We've got a pheasant that roller skates and a man who sits in trees and shits on passers-by. I always wanted to bring out a, a, a range of cuddly toys, which were based on, you know, like the Cabbage Patch toys. I mean, you had the Bob Wellings and you had um, the Michael Barrett and you had the Sue Lawley and you could get a complete set. I always pictured people putting them on their pillows when they went down to, you know, if, if you went into people's bedrooms, there'd be six station line reporters all in, nice and soft and cuddly on the top. You weren't worth your salt if you were a nationwide reporter and there was a funny place to do a feast of camera and you didn't do it there, so it was top of Tower Bridge, hanging off a bus. Or, of course, in a jacuzzi. Keep young and beautiful It's your duty to be beautiful Keep young and beautiful If you want to be loved You could go from doing a story about a savings bank going broke, serious story, threatening a lot of people and the bank, to jumping in a river to demonstrate that where this river met the sea there was a dangerous rip and that it was dangerous to children in summertime and to bathers. Uh, so the way you demonstrated that was on the principle of don't tell me, show me. The reporter jumps into the river, swims as hard as he can against the tide and is seen to be going backwards. Those are the days. But of course, nobody would ask you to do a thing like that these days. There's a phrase in comedy which is pull back trivial no trousers. And um, which is, you know, you, you, you start the camera tight on someone's face and then you pull back to reveal the fact that they're standing naked in a bath of yogurt. And, um, and that was constantly used the whole time. And, and you knew it was coming. <laughs> As a nationwide reporter, you had to be able to tackle anything from interviewing, uh, say, Edward Heath to um, some extraordinary animal. Hey, are you the only... Hey, are you are you the only trained are you the only trained piglet in the world? Oh, you are. Dark, really, and of course there's no program nowadays where that kind of thing could happen. Um, I wonder if I could have your views on Tibet and the chances of its independence. We always had animals on because uh, the editors believed in what they called the ah factor. Ah, what a lovely dog. Ah, what a lovely baby. Ah, what a lovely this. Oh, dear, good girl. Oh, little limpy pots. Little limpy pots. Don't be too long about it. She does attempt to mate with me, mm -hmm. and does actually um, have an animal orgasm, if that means anything to you. Does it? Yeah, it does, mm, except I don't, don't know. know how you would detect it in a duck. Oh, wouldn't you? No. Well, I can't explain that.
Daniel first started playing and winning at water skiing earlier this summer. In fact, after only a few weeks with the help of his owner, 14-year-old Helen Rogers, he won the local water ski championships. Well, the dog section anyway. The skateboarding duck was a duck that had actually learnt to, to, to operate and run up and down on the skateboard. It became a household name overnight. I mean, we had to keep on repeating this film and showing more and more and more about the duck. It was very funny to watch, and the duck actually was very clever. It became quite proficient, and it could actually turn the skateboard around. Other animal stories that we actually had on Nationwide were, um, for instance, Boozy the Snail, who um, I suppose you call the snail an animal, but he was reputed to drink a pint of beer. That is an extraordinary sight. Does he get tipsy now? <laughs> He's beginning to keel over now, I think. <laughs> I'll just make the beer a little bit frothy, because otherwise the snail might just fall in the glass. Oh. Before he absolutely keels yeah. over and, and disgraces himself. Can you, see the, can you see the mouth on the cat? He just had a little bit of froth. I'll put, him down for, I'll put him down for some more. Right on cue, live on the air before 10 million viewers, he crawled up the side of the glass, took a, took a little sip of beer and fell over backwards dead. Now, I was very sorry for the, for, for the snail, but at the same time I had to recognise the fact this may did make brilliant television. Embarrassing moments? I've got a classic here. Bob. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Jack. Thank you very much indeed. Your turn next. Oh, thanks very much. Now here we have uh, a lady who is a High Court judge. Yes. So, uh, how do I address her? Well, um, male High Court judges in this country are knighted and um, lady High Court judges have the title dame conferred on them mm. so it would be if you meet her socially it would be dame whatever her christian name is yes uh, on the bench it would uh be your ladyship or my lady or so and so i'm so sorry i must apologize uh, actually to our actors who've been standing here for a very long time under the lights do just stay there uh can we actually go past our poor judge they have been very patient, standing on these hot lights for a very long time. We yes. should have provided chairs, we didn't. It was something that touched ordinary people's hearts, but it really had strong standards. It had standards of fairness, of objectivity, of journalism, and I'll tell you something else. It was a sort of strangely Rethian program. You know, I would make a film about the woman in Banbury who'd been to 8,000 weddings because she went to a registry office herself, and it's a tear-jerking wonderful story, and it would be followed by a 15-minute analysis that was done well, well directed about, you know, the problem of the dirty protest in Northern Ireland. Now that's wreath. If you think someone came down and, and, and just watched Nationwide and tried to get a picture of Britain in the 70s from watching Nationwide, they'd have this picture of this country which was populated entirely by um, mad vicars who liked railway trains and um, people who dressed up in frocks, men who dressed up in frocks who go in front of cameras and people who grew very large vegetables and skateboarded on top of nuns. Um, and if you walk out the door afterwards, you wouldn't recognize the country at all. It's a complete fantasy. But it's a sort of conspiracy which you never want to believe that this is the truth about it. Here we go. Another epic is launched. Over to you, Chris. And I'm sure there's plenty of a cream from the wet. Hurry up, Frank. You're going to be late. Coming, darling. Everybody, ah, what's in the momentum? Ah. Thank you very much indeed. What a prince you are, and thank you very much for the cake. So, from all of us, thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>